You know, I find it interesting. Uh, I'm sure many of you are very familiar uh, what Jesus said in John chapter 10, that the thief comes only to, uh, to steal, to kill, to destroy, right? Um, Jesus said, but I've come to bring life, to give you life, and to give you life more abundantly. You know, we, we know that, we repeat it very often, but I, I wonder, I really do, how many of us, and when I say this, please understand, this includes yours truly. Uh, we can all get so caught up in uh, the affairs of our lives, the affairs of work, all those things. And uh, as a pastor, you know, I, I get caught up in the affairs of work too. Uh, we all do. But I, so I wonder sometimes when I, when I even read that verse to myself, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Do we really take advantage of the life that he's given to us? And I know that the answer is no. Most of us do not. And, uh, and, and I know that that's what he really does desire for us, that we would not settle for the life that the thief offers, but rather never settle for anything less than what Jesus offers us. And, and you know, what does the thief offer? He offers religious experience. He, he offers um, a, a life without freedom, without peace, without anything but rules to follow and religion, thinking we have to do these things in order to please God. When in reality, the Father has pleased himself by sending the only one in whom he is pleased, his Son, Jesus Christ, that we would find our salvation in him. And, and so, so how do we experience this life that Jesus has promised? That's really, uh, to me, that's the jumping off point in the study that we're going to look at tonight. We've been in the study in the book of Acts now for months and we come to this point, Paul has been in Corinth, he's met Aquila and Priscilla. Um, he has uh, taken off for, uh, he's gone back to Jerusalem for the feast, presumably for Pentecost. Uh, now he is actually on his way back. He's going through Galatia and Phrygia and those areas. In the meantime, uh, we see that Aquila and Priscilla have, um, they've met this one, and we're going to review it, but they've met this one, Apollos. Uh, brilliant man, and um, and they're going to spend time with him there as they as they go into Ephesus. You know, um, I I'm sure most of you are aware, I mean, and I'm not reading this over. I'll just give you the uh, the the scriptures, and you can read it for yourself. I want to keep moving in the study, but uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37. There's a prophecy there, and, and that prophecy specifically applies to Israel. It's prophetic of Israel in the last days when they're back in the land. But I believe that there's a, um, I don't want to call it a direct prophecy, but there's not, if nothing else, there is an echo of meaning for, for Christians, for, for, for whether you're Jewish or not, uh, for the Christian life. And that's this. Uh, God gives Ezekiel a vision of dry bones. You're probably familiar with it, right? And the famous song that was that was written uh, based upon this, that the, uh, the hip bone's connected to the thigh bone and all that, right? Um, them bones, them bones are going to rise up, right? Well, like God says there, don't get me singing, God, God says there to Ezekiel, son of man, see this valley of dry bones. He says, I see them. He says, speak to them. Tell them to arise. They arose. Um, and he says that, you know, that, that, that flesh and, and sinews and muscle came, came upon them. And so there was the appearance of life, right? But it wasn't until the second part of the prophecy where the Lord says, now speak to the wind or speak to the spirit. Wind and spirit are the same word in Hebrew, ruach. Speak to the ruach. And, um, and, and he did. And the spirit came upon those who had risen up and they became a great and mighty army. They were now alive. Well, in many ways, that is, as I said, an echo, if you will, an echo type of prophecy about the church, because in many ways we are the church. We know our theology, but are we really alive? I'm not saying, are we born again? Yes, born again. But are we experiencing the life and the power of the life by his Holy Spirit that God intends for us? In most cases, the answer is a resounding, very loud no. 
no, we're not experiencing everything that, that God has for us. You know, we're saved, we're going to heaven, we're orthodox in our theology, but very often we're just not experiencing the power that God has intended for us to experience. And so we see Apollos um, here. Let's, let's see. Let's pick up. I, I know that some of us, we looked at last week, so we're going to go quickly through it. Chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse 24. Uh, we read that Paul has gone off to Jerusalem. Uh, he went up to Jerusalem, and then he went back down, uh, ended up in Antioch, and then from Antioch heads out again on what becomes his third and final, third missionary journey. So while he's on his way back uh, toward, toward Ephesus, where he's going to meet up with uh, Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos, um, uh, he's heading through Galatia and Phrygia. And we see verse 24 that a certain Jew named Apollos, who was born at Alexandria, and that's Alexandria in Egypt, went over some of this last week, a very, very prominent city. Over a million people lived there. The, the ancient library in Alexandria is well, well known, had over 500,000, a half million scrolls. It was the largest library of the ancient world. Um, and... Uh, it's also the place where the Septuagint version of the Bible, uh, the Hebrew Bible, was translated from Hebrew into, into Greek uh, after Alexandria. is named after Alexander the Great, so after he had conquered uh, the world. Anyway, um, a certain Jew named Apollos, who was born at Alexandria. Now, he's a Jew, right? But he was born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and he was mighty in the scriptures. He knows the Bible. What Bible? He knows the Hebrew Bible, what you and I call the Old Testament, right? I mean, you don't have a New Testament at this point. It's just, just starting to get written. So it's not assembled yet. He's, he's mighty in the word of God, in the two-thirds of the Bible that most of us never really read. And uh, he came to Ephesus. And this man, we read, had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he was alive, he was on fire, he, he, just, he was passionate about everything that God intended, or so he thought. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, although he only knew the baptism of John. That's as far as he went, right? He, he only was to the point where he, you know, his understanding of, of Jesus was limited. Now, he, he had the social skills. He was eloquent. Uh, he's probably a man. He probably has a, um, a business. That's probably the reason why he's traveling through. But this is a man whose, uh, I'll say his avocation was, was to teach the word of God. Powerful man. He had so much happening in his life. Fervent uh, in the spirit. That idea is, you know, boiling hot. What did he understand in terms of the baptism of John? He understood the need for forgiveness of sins, right? That's what John the Baptist said. Um, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Um, he, uh, he understood that the expression of that repentance came through water baptism. That was very common. You know, we, we associate baptism with Christianity but we forget that it's really a Jewish expression in the first place. It, it, it always meant, uh, you know, a passing from an old life to a new life, you know, or a, literally a washing away of an old life and coming into a new life. In this case, that repentance, that baptism symbolized repentance in the sense of it was a washing away of sins and moving on into uh, as much as possible a sinless life. And of course, what John said, one was coming, who was going to pay the price for sins, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. But what John never experienced, because he died before it all happened, so what John was missing, and anybody who followed John, if they weren't aware of, of all the news, what, and this is what Apollos was missing, was an understanding of the cross. That this Messiah, Jesus, yes, he's bringing the kingdom, but first... He had to pay the price for sins. It's one thing to repent in your, in your flesh of your sins. It's another thing to, uh, to, to, to be justified by God and to have then the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ. So this, the cross 
is what accomplished that. So he, he couldn't and he didn't teach about the cross. He didn't teach about the death of Messiah. He didn't teach about the resurrection of the Messiah. He didn't teach about the ascension of the Messiah back to heaven with the promise that he would return or about the promise of his Holy Spirit. And of course, then Pentecost itself, when the Spirit of God came upon the church. These were things that, that Apollos didn't know about and couldn't teach about. Even so, he was uh, he, he, he was very much fervent and, and, and mighty in, the, in, in spirit and in word. Um, this man, we read, had been instructed in the way of the Lord, verse 25, being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of God, though he only knew the baptism of John. And so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue there at, there at Ephesus. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. I, I, I love this, and I know I said it last week, I've got to say it again. Number one, look at uh, the grace that this couple shows. You know, compared to Apollos, Aquila and Priscilla are you know, a working class couple. Um, they probably didn't have a lot of money. They were humble people. They didn't, they didn't call Apollos out publicly. It's like, hey, you got some things wrong here. They didn't do that. They, they made friends with him. They probably called him to their house and said, hey, can we, can we break bread together? Come on over, spend time with him. And in private, they began to reveal to him these things of Christ, to understand the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, what it means really to be born again. They explain these things. And imagine, this is a man who is eloquent, who uh, his oratory skills are are powerful. You know, Paul will talk about this in 1 Corinthians, that some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Apollo, some say I'm of Peter. You know, and Paul says, you know, what is Paul? What is Apollos? We're just servants. He said, I sowed Apollos water, but God's the one who's brought the increase. We're all just, we're just workers. That's all we are. But look at the humility then of Apollos to understand that he's hearing truth from this couple. Aquila and Priscilla. And he, he learns from them. Providential, isn't it then? How God works. Isn't it interesting how he ends up in the right place at the right time with the right people, right? I, I find that interesting how God loves to do that sort of thing. And so, so now, of course, uh, here, here he is. He's in uh, he's in Ephesus with them. Uh, so then, verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside, explained him the way of God more accurately. Uh, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, the, the brethren wrote, ex exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is Messiah. And he was, he was powerful. He, he was successful in, in what he came to do. Now we move into chapter 19. And so it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, now came to Ephesus. So Paul now comes into the region of Ephesus. Again, Ephesus, a very large uh, city. Um, he's a... Uh, Ephesus was assumed uh, to have about 300,000 people. It was considered in many ways, uh, the, it was a huge city. It was sort of the cultural capital of um, what people like to call Asia. We'll call it Eurasia or uh, Asia Minor. We call it Western Turkey today. Um, Ephesus, very large city, 300,000 people. Pergamos uh, was the capital city of that area. And you're probably familiar with these. Of course, Ephesus, we read there are two letters to the Ephesian Christians in the Bible, the one written by the Apostle Paul. And of course, the other one written, we read in chapter two of Revelation. There are seven letters that are dictated by Jesus to, the, to seven different churches, all of whom are located in Western Turkey or Asia Minor. And um, we can look at more of that later on. But so, so now Paul comes into Ephesus. Ephesus is going to be an interesting place. Of all the places that Paul has been, of course, he causes a riot again. We'll get to that later on. Not tonight, uh, but later on in chapter 19, he causes a riot uh, uh, because 
The sales of idols went down dramatically as people got saved, and a riot started as a result of that. Um, some things you want to look up, and you can find these things all online. Uh, there are a lot of great resources. You can find a lot of this in Blue Letter Bible. Um, the Zondervan, and there are a lot of different uh, Bible encyclopedias, but the Zondervan Bible Encyclopedia is great. It's a five-volume set. Uh, nowadays, you can find all these things online, but I just like books. Uh, but um, I'm not going to tell you why I like them. You can figure that out for yourself. Like some books. They're good to have, uh, and you can put notes in them. But uh, there you read about the temple of Artemis or Diana. It's the same, it's the same false god. But uh, the temple of Diana or Artemis in Ephesus was enormous. Uh, I forget the actual uh, footprint of this temple, but it had 127 pillars or columns. Each one of those was 60 feet high. 60 feet. I mean, well, if we were in the sanctuary, I would point to the ceiling and say, look at that, that's 10 feet. The, the, the ceiling in the sanctuary is 10 feet high. Imagine that six times that height. I mean, that's a breathtaking work in, in the ancient world. It's a big deal today, but breathtaking work. Um, so it was one of, the, one of the ancient wonders of the world, or wonders of the ancient world. Uh, but we read here about some disciples that Paul meets. Let's take a look at this. We're only going to go through seven verses in chapter 19, so uh, don't be getting your hopes up and think, okay, John's finally going to make some progress tonight. No, I want to make progress on a, on a topic that is fundamental for our Christian lives. And I say that because failure to understand this is most often the reason that many of us live defeated lives. So just seven verses. And so it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, or since you believed? You could translate it either way. And they said to him, We've not so much as heard that there is, or whether there is, a Holy Spirit. And so he said to them, Then into what, then, were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. See, we've got, a, got an interesting thing going on between Apollos. And now we have these 12 disciples who have the same issue going on. And Paul said to them, well, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Messiah Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name or into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. Okay, we see certainly that there's a difference, right, between uh, John's baptism and, and um, the baptism that's associated with Jesus Christ. Um, how do I want to handle this here? Well, so like Apollos, they were deficient. I don't, I don't mean that as a slur. They were just simply deficient. There were certain things that they didn't, they didn't know about. Um, they didn't understand the atoning sacrifice. If they were Jewish, they understood the need for atoning sacrifice, but they didn't understand that there was or that there could be one final sacrifice. For those of us who are not Jewish, it's hard for us to comprehend that sometimes. The idea that there is one sacrifice once for all. That's a that's a, a powerful idea. They didn't understand the idea of God's mercy and and his overwhelming grace. They didn't understand the beauty of, of God's love. They didn't understand um, the idea, really, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our resurrection. They didn't understand the idea of the kingdom. They had hopes. If they were Jewish, they had hopes for a kingdom that was coming, but they didn't understand and they sure didn't know about the Holy Spirit. This is important for us to, to get. So it took someone with the Spirit. I want you to understand this. It took someone who already was possessed by the Holy Spirit to discern the absence of the Holy Spirit in these in these disciples. And it's good to ask as you go through this, what was it? 
really now. What is it, what was it, about these disciples that the Apostle Paul noticed that he would ask this question? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, or since you believed? What was it? What did, what did he notice? Maybe there was no real power in their lives, no, no, um, no hunger for the Word, no fruit in their lives. It doesn't mean they weren't doing good things. But maybe there was no real zeal or that overpowering love that comes by God's Spirit. You know, when we read uh, in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is what? Well, we tend to say the fruit, meaning fruits like, like a plural. And we say there are nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. That the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, power, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Well, actually, Paul's not saying there are nine different fruits. The fruit, the, the, you know, what's born by the Spirit, not by the flesh, what's born by the Spirit is love that's expressed as joy and peace and, and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. That, see, the idea is love. Love is the fruit of the Spirit and, and is expressed in all these different ways. Um, and so it says that Paul laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. He prayed for them. They received Christ as their Savior. And they received the Holy Spirit. Um, boy, I got to tell you, there are a couple of really good books. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I say this from time to time. I hope, I hope you care to write these things down. Uh, one of them is this a little book, probably about 100 and, eh, 185 pages. They Found the Secret um, by, by Ray Erdman or Edmund. Um, you know, in it, you're going to read very, very short biographies of people like Charles Finney, uh, Luther, Moody, Spurgeon, uh, people who were, you know, contemporaries today. I mean, people like, um, oh, where is he? Uh, Richard Halverson, who was the uh, chaplain of the Senate. Um, a, a number of people. I think there's probably 20 different lives in here um, just a few pages written four pages written on each one you'll love this book because it will explain to you how their lives were changed when they allowed the holy spirit to take control of their lives please pick this book up it will really help you in your walk with jesus christ and um by the way, I, I put this, I don't get a commission. I'm just telling you, go online and buy this. Uh, it'll change your life. If you want to listen to it on Audible, that's fine too. But I think this is one of those books you want to own and you know, kind of mark up on your own. The other one, I don't have a copy handy. Tiny little book written by A.W. Tozer. Tiny little books are some of my favorites. Little books with big type. Um, it's called How to Be Filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I like it. It's just very simple. In fact, you know, and he deals in there with why we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And that really, in most cases, it's we don't want to give control of ourselves to another spirit. We can look at that in more detail at another time, but uh, this is not a, a give and take type of a, a program here. But uh, I challenge you, isn't that the issue? In many cases, now some, some of us may not know some of the things that we're covering here, but uh, in most cases, the idea of giving control of ourselves to another spirit, not our own, it's a little intimidating. But that's where change begins. That's where power happens and transformation in our lives. So two books. Uh, one is They Found the Secret by Edmund, and the other by A.W. Tozer, How to Be Filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that public service announcement is over. Let's continue on in the study. Um, so I often think, you know, when, when Paul sees these 12 disciples, what is it when he saw them, when he met them and started talking with them? Have you ever been in that situation? Yeah, you've been in that situation where you, you meet someone who's a believer, and at first they don't say anything, but you start getting the sense like, hmm, you know, I think there's something happening here. I, this, this guy's a Christian, or she's a Christian, right? And you've probably also been in that situation where you can tell someone's a Christian, but you feel like something's a little gestucken, um, technical term, that is, for 
there's a disconnect here. Something's going on. And, and so I often, the tra- to me, the next step in that question, what did Paul see in them or not in them? Then my question is, so if I was one of them, if Paul came across me on the road to Ephesus, what would he see in me that was missing? That he would say, have you received the Spirit since you believed? What would he say to you? Uh, these are good questions, and, and the, that's why I want to spend time on this, because many of us don't really stop to think about this, because, again, we, we, we find what's normal based upon what others in our church setting are doing. And that's a decent place to start. The real issue is, what is the Christian life and how should I live it? And the reality is, no one has ever lived the Christian life except Jesus Christ himself. So no one really can live the Christian life except Christ himself. If no one can live the the Christian life except Christ himself, and I'm called to live the Christian life, then Christ must be in me, and I must allow Christ to live in me and through me. So we refer to the Holy Spirit. He's also referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Again, very fundamental point. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not an it. Very often he's referred to as an it. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three co-equal persons of the Godhead, of one Godhead. Not three gods. They're co-equal members of the same Godhead. And so the Father tells the Son what to do. The Son is equal with the Father, but he does those things. Jesus says, I do only those things the Father tells me to do. And Jesus will say in in John 15 and 16, well, 14 through 16, say, when the Spirit comes, he will not draw attention to himself. That's a good one to remember because there are a lot of church services nowadays, a lot of churches that that have Holy Spirit meetings where they invite the Holy Spirit to do certain things, and, and it's almost like a, the, a Holy Spirit sideshow. That's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, doesn't draw attention to himself. He says, Jesus says, that when he comes, the Holy Spirit will glorify me, Christ. So, the Holy Spirit does everything to glorify the Son, who does everything to glorify the Father. That's the way things work here. Okay, so so here's Paul who comes across these disciples. Uh, he sees something apparently missing in them, and he invites them to you know to talk about things and you know what uh, tell me about what you believed. And he listens to them, and then he explains the gospel to them. They get, become saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, lives transformed. Um. If you think about it, there's a real picture of the church here. I mean, the church of Jesus Christ in general, but frankly, of our own fellowship. There are many in the church today that are educated, they're cultured, they're well-meaning, orthodox in the scripture, but powerless. They may be powerless because they're not born again. They know lots of things about the Bible, but they're not born again. Others who are born again, but don't have that power in their lives and the overpowering love there's there's that there, there's an essence of it but it's not it's not what drives them because they they're not controlled by the spirit of god um and many claim to know christ but they don't have that sense of the what jesus said would happen in our lives that there would be this abundance that there would be this uh torrent overflowing torrent of living water that would come through us you know jesus says in in uh john or excuse me in revelation chapter three he says i uh i would that you were hot or cold but you're you're neither hot nor cold because you're lukewarm i'm i'm ready to spew that's king james or puke or spit uh or wretch or you know you come up with your verbs, uh, to spew you out of my mouth. He says, I want hot or I want cold, not lukewarm. In um, 
Revelation chapter 3. Now remember, there are seven churches Jesus is writing to. The seventh one, in many ways, is a picture of the church in the world today, um, the church of Laodicea. But he writes there, I know your works, speaking to the church. Remember, he's speaking to the church. I know your works. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I would prefer that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, do we get a picture here? He's using these words over and over. Because you're lukewarm and you're not cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich. And I have no need of anything. I'm wealthy. I become. In, I have a need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. You know, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. It's interesting. We use that scripture a lot to share the gospel with people, and that's fine. But if we read it in context, who's Jesus speaking to? The church. He's speaking to a church, Laodicea. Jesus is outside of the church. He says, I'm knocking on the door, and I'm asking if you will let me into my church. Because they've said, we're, we're wealthy. We're, we're not in need of anything. He says, but you don't realize that you're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What's he talking about with this hot, cold, lukewarm? Well, and there's a lot of things you could do with this, and I'm, again, that's not the point of, of, of the study entirely tonight, but I want us to touch on it, because so if we're to look at hot, cold, and scripture, who do we see? Well, certainly you see the thief on the cross, right? See, if, if, if you're cold, there's hope for you. You can be saved. The thief on the cross was cold until he turned to Jesus, and then he was saved. If you're hot, well, the apostle John was hot, right? I mean, he was, he was on fire. He said, I would that you were cold or hot. It's lukewarm that bugs him. It's lukewarm. See, how often have I prayed lukewarm prayers? How often? I have to ask. I mean, I know for me, I have to assume for most of us who are a part of the study. How often have lukewarm believers turned people away from Jesus? Because they really don't love Jesus. They bear his name, but not his personality. Where does his personality come from? How do we bear the personality of Christ? Only his Holy Spirit can do that. The cause of Christ has been hurt so much more by Sunday morning pew warmers than by all the atheists and evolutionists that we like to throw sticks at. You know, it, and this whole idea of cold or hot, we, we like to be in our comfort zone. We, we don't want to be cold. We don't want to be hot. It's like, this is like Goldilocks. You know, we, we want the Goldilocks principle. We want to be, you know, just right. Jesus says, that makes me puke. Remember that. Uh, whatever you want to do with this, the more I try to explain away what it means instead of just taking it on face value, I think the more dangerous I'm finding myself, or more dangerous a place I'm finding myself in. You know, it's easy to find ourselves in a place of, what would you call it, union without communion. You know, we say we know Christ, but we don't have fellowship with him. You know what I mean? I mean, I do. I, I, I know exactly what I mean because I've experienced it. I'm sure you must know. It's one thing to say I'm a Christian, but not to really experience the, you know, the fellowship with Christ. I don't mean fellowship with other people. That comes as we have fellowship with Christ. Uh, or to have profession without real experience with Jesus Christ. To have life. Without health, you know, I, I have eternal life, but do I have, am I a healthy Christian? Am I growing by his spirit? Am I growing in his word? Um, we can have movement without progress. 
We do that a lot. We could be on the right side of Easter, but the wrong side of pardon. Have you ever thought about that? Or maybe another way to, to put it would be the right side of Easter and the wrong side of Pentecost. Look, you can argue with what I'm about to say doctrinally, but this thing has always gotten my attention. Charles Finney, he's one of the ones who, one of the 20 that are in that book I mentioned to you, They Found the Secret. His life was so transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, he used to teach that to reject the Holy Spirit is to reject Jesus Christ. See, we have whole denominations that seem to be built on where they or identified by where they stand with regard to the Holy Spirit and the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. And many denominations are so freaked out by some of the errors of what's called Pentecostalism um, that they do everything possible to say, oh, no, no, all that stuff, all that speaking in tongues stuff, all that word of knowledge stuff, that all ceased back in the, in the first century, at the end of the first century. Look, I understand where they're coming from. And again, this is not the place to go into that. We can do that some other time. But I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't go there if I were you. The Bible does not say that the, the moving of the Holy Spirit has ceased or that the gifts associated with the Holy Spirit have ceased. The Bible does not say that. Now, no question, there are some parts of the church that have emphasized certain aspects of the Holy Spirit to the point of error and have, and have so blown things out of proportion that, yeah, they've gotten it wrong. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not doing these things. It just means they're boneheaded and they got it wrong. We all get things wrong. Let's repent and get it right. John, where are you going with all these things? Well... You know, I, I think I mentioned to you last week that I, I, I wanted you to spend some time and just really read these seven verses. And I wanted, before we ended tonight, to go through five verbs. Five verbs. And I don't know if you take notes during these studies, but I hope, at least in this, that you will. I don't have notes to give you, but I think that you, know, you can find a pen and a piece of paper and please write them down. Five verbs, because these verbs are used all the time. They deal with what the Holy Spirit does. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 6, no one can come to me unless the Father first draws him. How does the Father draw us to Jesus Christ? We say, I was seeking after Christ. Well, it felt like we were seeking after him, and, and maybe in one regard we were, because the Spirit of God quickened our minds to say, I want to know more about God. Now we were seeking after him, but it was the Spirit of God who was drawing us. No man can come to, come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father first draws him. How does the Father do that? By way of his Holy Spirit. How do I know? I'm really glad you asked. If you turn to John chapter 14, you'll see something very important there. Please turn in your Bible to John chapter 14, because we read there this. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, beginning in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, or he will send you another helper. In other words, another one just like me. That he may abide with you forever. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit. Now look what Jesus says. Watch this very closely and circle these things in your Bible. He says, he is this helper that Jesus said he would send. He is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because the world does not see him nor does it know him. Look what he says. He's speaking to his disciples. But you know him. They didn't know that he, they knew him. He's talking about the spirit who he was going to send and Jesus is saying you already know him. You know him for he dwells with you and he shall be in you. Note this. Two prepositions. He's been with you and shall be in you. How did I come to Christ? He was with me. 
He was drawing me. He came alongside and he drew me toward Jesus Christ. When I came to know Jesus Christ, he, he came into me. You know, in fact, if, if you look at this for yourself, in uh, John chapter 20, this is the night of the, um, of the resurrection. After the resurrection, Jesus comes into the upper room, right? And he says to, to them, verse 22 of chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, Jesus said, he, he breathed on them and then he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. See, they believed. They saw him alive. They believed. He's, he, he died for me. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. They believed that he had done this. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Were they saved? Right. You're going to have a hard time convincing me they were not. They received the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was in them. Did you note two prepositions? With, alongside. Think of outside the body. In, inside, Jesus said, I will come and dwell in you. In fact, Paul says seven times in the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter will say that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit lives in us. Well, that's what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit has been with us, shall be in us. But note this, we saw it early in this study. In Acts chapter 1, right? They, they're asking, is it now that you're going to bring in the kingdom, Lord? He said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has set by his own author, authority. Excuse me, But you will receive power. Look at verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Three prepositions. Para means with. John 14, verse 17. Shall be in you. Ein, E-I-N, you could say, in Greek means in. And here, epi, upon. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. For what purpose? And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. It's important that we get these. We, we miss these so often. Now, I'm saying this because there, there's so much more, actually, um, that's involved in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. In the interest of time, I just want to keep it to a couple of things that I believe are very important and I would like you to study for yourself. <laughs> there won't be a test. I mean, life is the test of these things. But we read this here um, that in, um, in John chapter 3, we've looked at this recently. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus says, you know, we know that you must be sent from God because no one can do the things that you're doing un unless he's from heaven, unless he's been sent by God. And Jesus says, most assuredly, verse 5, or excuse me, uh, he says in, in verse 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is confused by that. How does that work? He's asking. Uh, he said, I say to you, unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, right, uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, water, is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said you must be born again. Now, now watch this. The, blind, the, the wind blows where it wishes. You, can't, you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from. You can't tell where it's going. And so it is with everyone who is, what? Born of the spirit. So there's the first verb. You must be born of the Spirit of God. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you're, what, born again. But it's a one-time usage. It happens once, and it's always used past tense. Once you're born again, you're born again. You can't be born again again. There's no need to be born again again, because you're already born again. Uh, I don't want to make a joke here. It's serious stuff. But, you know, you, you get the picture, right? You can't be born again again. It doesn't happen two times. Once you're born again, you are born again. There's the first verb. You must be born of the Spirit. And once you are, you're born of the Spirit. You're born again. In fact, the Bible says that we're baptized. That's where the word starts to get a little hairy for some people. But we're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says... In verse 13 of chapter 12, he says, By one spirit we were all baptized 
into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves, free, we've all been made to drink the same spirit. You must be baptized into the body of Christ. We're baptized in. You know, Paul says something interesting in Romans chapter 8. So first ver- the first verb is what? Born of the Spirit happens once. Now you look at your life, that's past tense. You were baptized into Christ. Happened once. You don't get baptized into Christ a second time. You're already in. You're already in. Because we didn't get into any of this by our own merits. It's by what he did for us. Third verb. Indwelt by the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Uh, What does he say here? Uh, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. In fact, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. You're not Christ's. You're not, you're not in him if you don't have the Spirit of God living in you. But if you do have the Spirit of God living in you, if you are in Jesus Christ, if you're born again, if you've been baptized into the body, then you have the Spirit of God living in you. Just as Jesus said in John uh, chapter 20, verse 22, receive the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit. He's not withholding it from you. You have his spirit in you. Born of the spirit, baptized by the spirit, indwelled by the spirit. Ooh, here's a great one coming up. Sealed by the spirit. Ephesians chapter one. I love this. I love this. He says this. Ephesians chapter one. I never know, you know, these first 14 verses of chapter one of of Ephesians is like, you don't know where to start because it's all connected by commas. Paul writes heavy stuff, uh, really. I mean, the, 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 I always say the sentences just bend from the weight of what he's talking about. Uh, he says, in verse 13, you who trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having, been, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of uh, until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. What does all that mean? Well, first of all, there's a seal on you. In the ancient days, a king would put his seal on his own possession, usually wax in a, in a piece of copper or gold, and he would seal to say, this is mine. No one messed with the possession of the king. And in the heavenlies, for all of the demons of hell to see, You've been sealed by the mark of Christ himself. You're one of the king's kids. You cannot be messed with. You can't be possessed by another spirit except for that of Jesus Christ. And when you use God and guarantee in the same sentence, you're cooking with grease, man. Let me tell you, you've got good things happening. The seal of the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our redemption. Four verbs. Born of the Spirit. What? Baptized by the Spirit. Do you remember now? Indwelled by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit. Four verbs, but there's a fifth. But four of those verbs are all one time, past tense. But there's a fifth one. And we read it over here in Ephesians chapter 5. He says here in verse... Oh, there's always so much. But in verse 18... Paul writes, chapter 5, verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine. Don't be drunk. Don't be consumed or uh, don't be uh, consumed by something that can control you, is what he's saying. Don't be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we don't see it as clearly in English, but in Greek, and you look that up for yourself, go to a Vines Expository Dictionary or, or go to Blue Letter Bible, look it up. The idea, it's a continuing sense in the Greek. Be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, yes, there is a point at which, you know, after we're saved, we can come to Christ and say, Lord, take control of my life. Just take control of my life. You can do that right now. Or take control of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use my life the way you desire to use my life. May I be the man or the woman that you want me to be 
I don't want to set the agenda, Lord. I just am yours, and I want to be used by you. Pray that prayer. In fact, pray it now. While we're, while we're here, right now, be praying that. You know, it's so important that we understand Jesus, and I, I think just a couple of weeks ago I may have mentioned this, but in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says it right there. He says, which of you fathers, if your son were to ask for bread, would you give him a, a stone? Are you going to give him a rock to gnaw on? If he asked for a fish to eat, will you give him a scorpion or a snake, depending upon the translation you're looking at? No, is the obvious answer. He said, so if you being evil and you know to do good things for your child, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, God's not withholding his Holy Spirit from you. You say, but I just got this sin in my life. Well, confess it. Say, Lord, I confess these sins to you. I want to be controlled by your spirit. Take control of me. I repent of these things, but I, or you could say, you know, I believe, help my unbelief, help me to, to walk in you, but take control of me. You think he won't? He longs to do that. He longs to do that. Four verbs, past tense, one time, born again, baptized, what? Indwelt and sealed. The fifth verb, ongoing, be continually being filled all the time. We pray that as a worship team every, every Sunday morning. We pray, Lord, use us. Use us in the service. You know, we, there are musical talents in this group. There, you know, we've got abilities to teach, all those things. But it's not worth a hill of beans unless you do it, Lord. It has to be by the empowering of your Holy Spirit. And that's the way it works in our lives. That's the way it works in our personal lives and every aspect of our personal lives. So look, spend some time with God on these, on these five verbs. Spend some time on those verses that I've shown you tonight. And ask God to do a mighty work in your life. It's what he longs to do, I can assure you of that. More than anything else, that's what he wants to do right now in your life.